and sediment dynamics, and one of the things that we have been talking about, and I think you guys have questions about, um, he's been looking uh, in some areas, including locally after the Thomas fire, at the post-fire sediment transport, which I know is something that some of us are interested in. Um, and so today's going to be talking about watershed and suspended sediment dynamics from the headwaters to the harbor. So thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. Claire and I have been uh, running into each other at sort of um, different workshops and symposia that are focused on microplastic pollution. And so my, my kind of research pathway has taken me to sediment and then to a little bit into microplastic as this sort of completely anthropogenic sediment that can really be thought of nothing else, uh, nothing other than a pollutant. And as we'll see today, I'm gonna kind of run through quote unquote natural sediments, of course, they can be impacted by human activities a lot as well. And there are many complications in terms of this interweaving of the sediment as a resource and sediment as a pollutant. Um, so I'll march into it. Um, first, here are, are my graduate students out of UC Riverside. Um, Juliana works down in coastal regions, um, studying coastal morphology and sedimentology and exploiting recent sedimentary records of uh, hydrology and past uh, environmental change. Uh, Nathan Jumps and, and Jimmy Geiminger, they both work on um, post-wildfire sediment transfer, mostly at pretty small scales, but then also to, to the watershed scale. Uh, and then Wynn Cowger, uh, who Claire is not, um, he's our trash man. So he's, <laughs> he's the guy who's responsible for actually kind of pulling my eye and kind of studying anthropogenic debris and, and microplastic. But that's, that's probably the last I'll talk about that today. I'm kind of, I feel like I was just telling Claire, I think, at this last meeting that all I've been doing lately is just like writing grants to try to fund microplastic work. <laughs> because every time I think I can go back to this stuff, another opportunity comes up and, and we've been chasing it. But um, on to things that I, I know more about and I, I get really excited about. So <laughs> fine sediment. I actually came out of a lab that was focused on coarse sediment. It was really focused on gravel bedded rivers, and using two-dimensional hydrologic mo uh, hydrodynamic modeling to understand gravel transport, um, and all tied in really to our charismatic, uh, I don't know if you call it megafauna, but <laughs> sort of like fallen angels or something in terms of how we treated the, the, the salmon that were disappearing from rivers. I'm not gonna talk about any of that, I'm gonna talk about mud. Right? That, that's really my focus. So I was like the mud guy in the lab where everybody else was like doing a second computer model. But hopefully I'll convince you if you're not already convinced um, that mud is really, really, really important. And I would argue that it's, it's absolutely an environmental master variable. It's one of the most important things that are moving through our, our watershed systems and, and coastal systems as well. Um, one of the reasons is, is, is the fact that you have so much surface area that's tied up in sediment, right? So if you're holding about a handful of mud, you have about a, a football field worth of surface area in your hand, right? And that surface area isn't just um, some static physical surface. It, it actually, a lot of it, particularly as you get down to the clay regime, they're really fine particles, you know, nominally below four or two microns, depending on where you cut the line. You have a lot of charged surfaces. And those charged surfaces uh, tend to be carrying uh, a lot, if not all or most of, your hydrophobic contaminants that are moving through your system, okay? Um, heavy metals. Many of the pesticides, herbicides, uh, significant nutrients, um, organic carbon, most of the microbial load that are moving through rivers are actually not in a dissolved state. Most of that flux is riding along with sediment, and most of that's on fine sediment. Um, when we think about fine sediment moving through rivers, you know, if, if you're if you're just coming to the issue, you might think, well. Sediment is transport limited. Right? You might think that you need enough river flow, enough uh, energetics in your flow field to actually mobilize sediment and move it through the system. And that's true, but the, the fact is when you get down to this sort of mud zone, silt and clay, most of the flows that we encounter in, in natural rivers have an abundance of power for transporting that kind of material. Right? And so one of the ways to look at this is that <coughs> This, if this was a, a cross section or, or a long section rather of flows, so flows going downstream uh, to your right, uh, if you look down through that depth of this river flow field, 
you'd find, and, and then this took samples of different kinds of sediment, right? You'd find that with the, the finest fraction, you actually have no concentration depth profile whatsoever. Mm. Um, and the reality is, and, and then as you get to your coarser fraction, some of it would only be found kind of bumping along the bottom. We call that bed load. The stuff that doesn't have any kind of concentration depth dependency we call wash load. And it's the finest fraction, oftentimes in body clay, sometimes even into a lot of the sand. Right? And the reality is, if actually your tractive power of this flow field increases as you go down through the depth profile. And that's why we see these kinds of relationships. But it's another indication of the fact that this mud that's transported through these rivers is usually not transport limited. Right? There's an abundance of power to move this stuff around. It's actually um, supply limited. It's, a, it's almost completely a supply limited scenario, uh, which has ramifications on how we study this stuff and, and try to understand dynamics of the watershed scale. Um, so as we start thinking about fine sediment moving through rivers, um, of course, geologists, people that study Earth's surface processes, oftentimes what we want to know really are, are fluxes at the end of the day, just the simple accounting. How much of this stuff is moving around for a unit of time and from where? And you could blow that up to the global scale and try to publish in Nature and Science or whatever, <laughs> right? And that's, that's where these uh, maps like this come from. These big black air, all these arrows are scaled to the sediment load that's coming out of these regions, right? So the mass flux of sediment, in, in this case on an annual basis. Uh, well, actually, in this case, it's yield, so it's been normalized to surface area. And what you see is that these uh, parts of the world, so this, this um, essentially the, the, this sort of uh, Western Pacific arch over here is producing a ton of sediment. We also have a lot of sediment, uh, relatively speaking, coming off of the coast of um, uh, the Pacific West Coast of the US. And other places, you have some massive rivers that are represented, such as the Amazon. The reality is it's, it's small, mountainous rivers on active margins that are actually producing most of the sediment that's being discharged to the oceans, including the kinds of rivers that we have here in Southern California and, and Northern California as well where we have relatively recently uh, built mountain ranges um, that are right on the coast with very little storage that intercept uh, and oftentimes intermittent rainfall that produces a lot of sediment. And so most of that sediment is coming from small mountainous rivers at a global scale, um, which sort of supports the notion that just from a mass flux perspective, maybe we should be interested in small mountainous rivers like the ones that we have here. And then most of that sediment that's actually reaching the ocean is fine sediment, so probably something on the order of you know, 90% of it or so. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, hopefully I've convinced you that fine sediment's important, both in terms of global scale mass flux from the terrestrial earth to the oceans, also in terms of nutrient fluxes to some degree and pollutant transfer. Um, and the fact is that if you start looking at watersheds and thinking about sediments moving through watersheds, you know, being delivered to channels and then making their way through channelized systems, you can really think of sediment as a resource or an impairment. Now, most of you in the environmental science field, if you've heard about fine sediment, you've probably heard about it in the context of impairment, right, as a pollutant. But in reality, all natural rivers carry sediment. Every single one of them does. Now, we're used to living in a world that humans have massively altered, right, particularly places like, like the US and California that have been developed to such a high degree. And so we're used to hearing at this point about fine sediment, uh, about erosion being aggravated, larger supplies of fine sediment making its way to channels, and that having problems in the channelized system and downstream, both from the standpoint of the sediment itself and then all these other pollutants that can be riding on the sediment. But um, we also need sediment supply to channels, fine sediment and coarse sediment. Right? We, what we're realizing now in Southern California from a coarse sediment perspective, and I won't talk about that much more today, is that in many of these urban systems, particularly you know, as you get further south from here, we've sealed up the surface to such a degree with concrete and asphalt. Um, now that, that usually leads to a wave of fine sediment moving through these systems that then tapers off, but we've really effectively sealed off coarse sediments. So a lot of these rivers uh, in, this, in the Southern California are really coarse sediment starved and that, that they're now just starting to realize that that's a really important resource that they need to start protecting and, and invigorating. But, you know, particularly with climate change and, you know, new static sea level rise, 
we have relative sea level rise going through the roof in a lot of parts of the world. In a lot of parts of the developed world, we've also, not only have we aggravated erosion in certain places, but we've also <coughs> instrumented rivers with dams and levees. We've done a lot of uh, hydraulic modification, right? And you, as you start to put dams in, you trap sediment, right? So we're also starting to starve coastal regions of sediment, which has big ramifications in terms of continuing to be able to accrete the kinds of marshes and wetlands that would normally be there and kind of be able to jog along with sea level rise, much less um, rise to the accretionary occasion of rapidly increasing sea level rise. So in this sense, we have a lot of watersheds where fine sediment is both a pollutant and a resource in the same watershed, just in, in different places, right? So maybe if you're in a gravel bed of reach, where the salmon need to access that gravel, fine sediment there is seen as, as, as a big problem. And it's not just about the natural dynamics of the system, it may be the fact that that little reach of the river is the only place salmon can be in anymore. So you have to do all this crazy stuff to try to protect it, protect it from the natural variability that might have been there in the first place. And then that same system, as you get down to the coast, they may desperately need fine sediment to maintain accretion or to even have accretion occur, occur over drastically polluted sediment like they, like they have up in the in uh, San Francisco Bay. Okay. Um, and that's essentially what this, so I should have been blabbing a lot out in front of this. Stuff, <laughs> okay, and this is the example of uh, the Central Valley of California, the Sacramento San Joaquin system, which comes down to the Delta in the San Francisco Bay, where they have exactly this problem. They've actually flipped the sediment supply of the system. Most of the sediment coming into San Francisco Bay used to come from the western slope of the Sierra Nevada. Mo much of that has been dammed off, holding that sediment back. It's, it's accreting the reservoirs now. Um, and then there's been a lot of development in parts of the coast ranges to the point now that um, San Francisco Bay, where it used to probably get 80 to 90% of the sediment from the western slope of the Sierra Nevada, now gets 80 or 90% from the directly adjacent coast ranges that have been heavily influenced by urbanization and industry and are delivering a lot of pollutants. So, so. Um, and that's all, you know, this is all work from other people that are blogging about right now, such as uh, uh, Shulhammer and McKee and others uh, in the USGS. Okay, so for much of the rest of this talk, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna focus on what actually controls the dynamics of, of fine sediment delivery and transport through watersheds. And we'll start you know, with, with this, this great little uh, cartoon that was originally developed by Google back in the 70s, where you know, we think about sort of erosional zone, our, our high slope mountainous regions, um, where over long time scales, erosion is really set by tectonics and the interplay between tectonics and climate. Then we have our transfer zone uh, as we get down into the, the lower slope parts of our system. Uh, you know, you, you might think about it as floodplains and wetlands. And then out to the coast, right? where we have our sort of quote unquote depositional zone, where you may also have tectonic de deformation that's increasing your accommodation space, et cetera. Um, so another way, another word that we use or another phrase that we use to describe the system is the sediment cascade. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to read this if you'd like, but the important thing that I highlight is that the fact that when we're talking about the sediment cascade, we're talking about all possible sources to all possible sinks at the watershed scale, right? And so I'd like to throw this up to, to highlight the fact that what we're talking about is a highly dynamic, highly complex system. Because usually when I first introduce watershed scale sediment dynamics or sediment moving through river systems of people, many scientists, particularly scientists in other fields, will think, well, that that's, sounds really simple. Why haven't you guys figured that out yet? It's just mechanics. <laughs> right? um, but the reality is, uh, it is relatively simple, say, at the flume scale, or maybe even at the plot scale, but then once you start to increase scale, it gets uh, very, very complicated because you have a lot of different processes in a lot of different places operating at different time scales that are overprinting on each other. Um, and so when we think about the continuum of the sediment cascade, um, we really have to think about not just space, but time, right? Because when you start eroding part of the watershed, uh, it takes time for that sediment to move through the watershed to get to the coast, right? And that time is somewhat dependent on the characteristics of the watershed, 
the climate that it's in, <coughs> um, and the vegetation that's happening there, other things that humans are doing, and then it also really depends on the characteristic of the sediment that you're interested in as well, right? So sediment size matters. Um, and so when we think about you know, <coughs> kinds of forcings that can be influencing sediment dynamics, you know, we have things that can be extremely instantaneous, instantaneous events, say like the Thomas fire burning down an entire watershed. So that's sort of instantaneous in terms of geological history. Maybe it takes place over the span of a month or two. Um, it may have results that last for months or years or perhaps even decades. The Thomas fire, in terms of sediment flux, it depends on what your focus is, right? Uh, in terms of spatial scale. Um, and then we have our different tools to try to access uh, this in terms of time uh, and our different means of monitoring the system in terms of time and space as well. And so mostly today, um, basically we're gonna march down from the headwaters to the zone of, 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 uh, of transport and the definition zone uh, using some different techniques that are mostly, that are, that are focused on event to essentially um, Lake Holocene time scales. So sort of uh, moments to a couple a thousand years or so. Okay. So <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that really when we're dealing with fine sediment, we're dealing with supply issue, right? The water that's if it's moving through the system, of course, supply the supply issue is a little misleading here in Southern California where all of our rivers are ephemeral, even our largest <laughs> rivers, right? even our 10,000 square kilometer watersheds are essentially <coughs> only producing flow, oftentimes during storm flow. Um, but when the rivers are flowing, they, they have tons of capacity for moving fine sediment usually. Um, the, the issue here when we start getting into supply is that we're dealing with something that's a diffuse supply usually at the watershed scale. We're dealing with something that's coming from many, many different parts of the watershed. Now, we also do have given point sources of sediment. You might think of them as landslides that end up falling into the channel, right? Debris flows. Um, at the hill slope, slope scale, though, we do generally have transport limited conditions, right? So as you start to get towards sediment supply, you start, you start marching up into the hill slopes to try to understand what's controlling uh, the mobilization of that sediment in its delivery right. um, From a human perspective and things that we've done to increase erosion, this, the, the examples are many. And these all exist in California, of course, from uh, you know, semi-arid rangeland that's been managed for the production of cattle and sheep, um, to agriculture, much of it here in California is irrigated, uh, timber harvesting is really well-known roads, road infrastructure, much of which um, in terms of the most erosive road infrastructure is associated with timber harvesting. All of this exists in California and is known to, to drastically increase sediment loading, particularly in steep environments. Um, but again, we also do have a lot of impoundment. And so in Southern California, in particular, we have lots of these things that kind of look like reservoirs, right? But this is a reservoir with a big slotted snorkel in it, essentially, right? So it's not a reservoir that's meant to hold water. It's meant to, it's meant to let water actually bypass it. This is a reservoir that's meant to hold back sediment. It's a debris basin. LA County alone has, I think, close to 200 of <coughs> these. Right? Uh, instrumented along the wildland urban interface at the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains, in particular for LA County, um, where they're trying to protect humans and infrastructure from particularly the wildfire um, the wildfire storm cycle that produces a lot of our sediment in these, these steep foothills, okay. with the idea of disconnecting headwater sediments and saving lives. Right? So, as I'm sure all of you are very familiar with at this point, having, <laughs> um, you know, having one of the biggest fires on record rip through not too far from here, or essentially almost here. Um, you know, if you have and this is in the context of <coughs> this is from a paper um, that I was on with John Warwick back during my PhD. Um, you know, when, when you have these chaparral slope steep environments, you know, you have your soil development, you have vegetation that's stabilizing the soil. If you're on steep slopes, you might have downslope transport of sediment, and a lot of it ends up getting trapped behind vegetation. Burn that slope and produce dry gravel because this sediment that's over steepened ends up falling right down to the channel. You develop hydrophobic layers, 
as waxy substances from these plants recondense in the soil and drastically decrease infiltration rates. Then once you get some rainfall on that surface that's been prepared in this way by fire, you have a lot of loose sediment that's ready to be, to be moved around, some that's already preloaded into the channel, and you're drastically increasing the apportionment of that stormwater, or rather that, that precipitation, into runoff, rather than you know, routing it into the ground to eventually <laughs> go back as ET or to, or to trickle into through deep percolation to, to, um, to groundwater and base flow. And then once you get into like really heavy rainfall, you know, you may transition up into other kinds of erosional regimes that go beyond just, you know, uh, moving loose superficial soils with um, sheet flow or erosion. You might get into gullies. And we have these progressively bulk the reflows that can happen without even having a landslide for that channel. You can just have all this kinds of shallow erosion and a bunch of sediment in the channel from dry gravel that ends up turning into a dirt reflow, which is a flow that doesn't it no longer functions as a regular one. There's so much sediment in your in your admixture of sediment and water that's moving down a channel that it ceases to function like a leaky fluid. Um, so my group has has gotten interested in this. The next, as we march down the system, we're going to eventually get to where I started. This is actually where I am now so in, terms of, <laughs> in terms of my my research pathway. I started at the base of watersheds, you know, trying to look at this integrated signal of what was going on and being generally confused by it. But, I mean, I didn't stop me from publishing some papers, but and some of them may, I think, some some of the insights were sort of real, but <laughs> it, it, it pointed me towards going back to the smaller scale and back to the zone of erosion to study the supply issue in a way that was much more direct, right? And so what my lab group has been doing is to go into some of these foothill regions that experience wildfire, try to get in there as quickly as we can, and take it, and, and like many others are, are doing at this point, take advantage of the fact that you have a bare surface and we now have tools at our disposal that can directly uh, map those surfaces in really high resolution particularly because the, the vegetation is gone, right? So we use drones mounted with cameras and, and we exploit photogrammetry techniques uh, in order to create digital elevation models of those surfaces. We kind of do that at the sort of five to 10 hectare scale. And then we also use terrestrial laser scanners, more at like the one hectare scale. Um, and then of course, at, at the much larger scale, we're also exploiting LIDAR when possible, particularly when there's been a good pre and post flight. And we have a, a big LIDAR flight coming up this summer on sites on those one by NSF. Um, and with LIDAR, you know, we can go up to multi-square kilometer scales, right? With LIDAR, you know, maybe we can get down to like um, half a meter to decimeter scale uh, accuracy in the Z, so an elevation. With um, structure for motion and really good ground control points, we can get down to maybe five centimeters, five or 10 centimeters. And then with terrestrial laser scanning, we can, we can get sub-centimeter. So we can scan a hectare uh, and then scan it again after the next rainfall event, make a new map of that three-dimensional surface, and difference those surfaces and see where the erosion's happening and where the deposition's happening down to about a centimeter scale change in tension erosion. And then we're also instrumenting these watersheds with you know, the usual um, hydrometeorological types of uh, monitoring apparatus, precipitation, and we're trying to do energy balances. And then sometimes, even the, the PI has to dig holes. <laughs> and in this case, we're not only looking at this debris flow deposit, but we're also trying to get one of our pressure transducers back. <laughs> uh, which ended up, we ended up being buried by two meters of sediment and we never found it again. I think we should have bought uh, a metal detector. <laughs> um, that was a pro tip. So, um, we, so, so we're on our fourth wildfire now, um, and the last two have, have, have produced some really good examples of contrasting response to wildfire. So my latest PhD student who's been working on this, um, right after he came into town, essentially, uh, we, had a, we had a wildfire right behind campus in the Box Spring Mountains, about a thousand uh, acre fire. But most of this was coastal sage scrub, that had then been tight converted over time by invasive annual grasses. So the fire went from the, the base of this, um, you know, a couple hundred meter mountain to the top in like <coughs> 10 minutes, right? It just roared right through. Um, so the burn intensities were really low. And as it turns out, the, the, the 
the cumulative soil processes or, or soil uh, characteristics underneath these grasses on these hill slopes were much different than what we've experienced previously in the San Gabriel Mountains under Chaparral, and then later in Leech Canyon, uh, which experienced the Holy Fire just this past summer. So these are two places that burned in the last couple of years, and in both cases we were monitoring at a quasi-event scale, essentially trying to hit after every rainfall event or two uh, to go back to the area and revisit it with these direct monitoring techniques um, in terms of mapping these surfaces. Right? Um, so lower burn intensity, higher burn intensity, um, you know, in, in both cases, uh, relatively almost exactly the same steepness of slopes on average, you know, 0 0.63, these are very steep slopes and rather treacherous to hike around. Um, but very different responses, even in terms of dry gravel. Tons of dry gravel in these canyons, so that's this new sediment that just falls down in the channel before rain even comes. Um, a lot of soil hydrophobicity, whereas in the box springs, almost no uh, hydrophobicity and very, very minimal, minimal gravel. Okay. So in the box springs, um, after uh, essentially our, our, one of our first uh, light rainfall events, and so the other thing that contrasts these two systems is that the, if, if any of you think back, and maybe it's probably a little bit different here, but um, water year 2018 was pretty weak, right? And this year has been pretty, pretty intense. So, but nonetheless, you know, we had some, uh, some small rainfall events and we were, able to, we were able to do a few things, including contrast the responses of some of these gullies within our terrestrial laser scanning zone, right? So here we have elevation change, uh, erosion is the warm colors, deposition uh, is the cold colors. And you can see that a lot of the hill slopes are essentially sub-threshold, right? We can't really uh, pick up what's going on, which is one of the reasons we decided to start focusing in these, in these gullies. Um, and what, what we found in this case is one gully essentially functioning as a intermittent storage during this event. So you have net uh, deposition within this gully. Uh, and then its neighboring gully is actually functioning as a sediment source with net erosion. And so some of the work that's coming out of this area, because we have these really um, highly sensitive techniques, we can start to get down to these kind of um, sort of boring rainfall runoff events they don't really, in all, in all these cases, they produce almost absolutely nothing at the base of this tiny headwater catchment, right? In terms of water or sediment discharge. But you have a lot of uh, small scale uh, intra catchment redistribution of sediment that we think probably plays an important role in, in how the system ends up responding to subsequent effective events that are actually producing sediment. And really, as it turns out, but be that as it may, these sort of little surface shifting kinds of um, uh, sediment transfer events, the reality is in this system, because infiltration rates <coughs> stay so high, even after wildfire, um, as it turns out, the really effective events that, that move a lot of sediment in this area are shallow landslides, which have something to do in this case with the fabric of the bedrock itself. Um, and how you end up having a lot of sort of steeply sloped slabs that accrue sediment over time, some of which is probably through this uh, small scale uh, downslope transfer from these smaller events that end up accruing sediment on the slope over time. And then they turn, you know, they, they actually have time to kind of turn into soils. My soil scientist colleagues call everything a soil anyway. <laughs> I think they call the dry gravel in the, chan in the channel for two months a soil. <laughs> but, and then eventually you have not high, necessarily high intensity short duration rainfall event, but longer duration series of storms that wet the system up and then destabilize those shallow soils that are sitting on top of bedrock contact, um, saturating them, right? Change, and, and then through poor pressure destabilization, end up causing a bunch of shallow soil slides, which are mapped here in, in red. This, and this all happened um, in 2010, 2011, and were mapped by my colleague, Nick Barth using aerial photographs. Uh, and so it appears that this system is really dominated by these saturation-driven shallow mass wasting events, not post-wildfire uh, shallow erosion sediment uh, generation. And this is a comparison of uh, the essentially the precipitation events that happened 
in uh, 2010-11 versus what we were experiencing uh, <coughs> two months seasons ago. And that was, you know, a big, uh, a big series of atmospheric variables. Okay. Now in Leech Canyon, where we're doing, where we, where we've been doing our work this year, steep chaparral, uh, the stuff that we're really used to dealing with, where essentially here you're looking down at this um, headwater channel. You can see it looks very smooth. That's because it's come, it's filled with dry gravel, much of which has fallen down slope this year, right? Essentially after that wildfire, before any kind of rainfall happened. Um, and then this is what happened after essentially some of the first effective events, right? Where we have some, you know, relatively small but uh, moderate intensity rainfall events that produced enough water, enough runoff to essentially scour that uh, the dry gravel down to bedrock. Um, and we see the progression of all these rill networks that end up going all the way up to the channel divide. And I can't talk about this without showing a little bit of sediment transport <laughs> porn. <laughs> so this is a time lapse camera. I think every frame is about, I think it's one every 10 seconds. And there we go. So essentially, you see water dominated flow at first. So this is after this channel's already been excavated, right? This is a subsequent rainfall event. Um, I'll show it again. I can't. <laughs> and then, so you see that there's runoff response during the rainstorm, but then eventually you hit time of concentration uh, where you're routing a lot of that, a lot of that water and sediment that's been essentially eroded from the hill slope through really shallow erosional processes, sheet wash and rill, nothing else, right? Uh, and it produces these mud flows. And, that that one wasn't like a granular debris flow, but the the concentration of sediment in that water was probably, um, you know, not you know greater than greater than you know ten to fifty grams per year. Okay, but when we have these effective erosional events happening uh, in these hill slopes, they have to go somewhere, right? They end up down in the channelized system. They end up getting transferred through the watershed, right? <clears throat> but in terms of trying to detect those kinds of signals, if you want to understand what's controlling the amount of sediment, the dynamics of the sediment transport through your system, there's lots of things in the way that can end up messing with that signal, right? Um, whether it's uh, you know impoundments or um, other things that humans are doing, or just the 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 nature of routing that sediment through the system itself, right? The intermittent deposition and resuspension of that sediment as it moves through the system that ends up attenuating your signal. Um, at the watershed scale then, what we're essentially left with are uh, over these sort of short time scales, so sort of event to multi-year time scales, are really the tools of a hydrologist, right? Where we're measuring river flow, so volumetric discharge, and the concentration of sediment that's in the water, right? Um, and because, uh, you know, essentially you have the same kinds of internal and external forcings that are acting to supply water to the channel, that oftentimes are, a lot of those are really the same processes that are supplying the channel with sediment as well. What we end up doing, right, is we end up oftentimes first looking at the relationship between the water discharge and the sediment that's being transported, right? Because oftentimes, you know, we can measure water discharge pretty easily, uh, and it, it essentially ends up functioning almost as a, as a as a proxy for all of these watershed scale processes that can be contributing to the supply of sediment. And then of course, we call that a rating curve. So this is in log log space, um, volumetric discharge to sediment concentration. We can use that rating curve because it's difficult to monitor suspended sediment concentration to uh, predict sediment concentration if we want to and then convolute it again by discharge to get sediment flux, right? Uh, but then we can also use this approach to inquire, make inquiries into that, into that record of uh, sediment transport and sediment dynamics to try to better understand how things might have changed over time. So the reality of these small mountainous rivers that we have here on the west coast of the US is that there's a tremendous amount of variability in suspended sediment concentration, even within one river. So here again, we have volumetric discharge, so this is cubic meters per second on the x-axis, 
suspend the sediment concentration on the y-axis, right? We're in, we're in essentially, you know, log scale. And what we see is, you know, on the order of, it's very common to see four orders of magnitude uh, difference in the suspended sediment concentrations that might be expressed by a given river. This is the Salinas River. And then even after you fit this relationship, you may have something on the order of two orders of magnitude uh, variability around that rating curve itself, right? So the rating curve, you know, obviously there's some kind of relationship here, but it's still not really reducing the variability down that much, maybe a couple orders of magnitude. Um, and then if we're going to assume from, if we wanted to, if we were a geologist, put our geology hat on and say, hey, I want to really understand how much, how much sediment is coming out of the system, we we'll take this whole data set, fit this curve, and march forward and calculate flux, and just assume that the system is functioning in, in a stationary way, not changing. In other words, this concentration discharge relationship doesn't change over time, okay? And move forward, um, which I'll circle around to in a second. But another thing that's important to point out is that it's not, another thing that we think about when we're really interested in how much sediment's moving through these systems is really what kinds of discharge events are contributing most of that sediment flux to the coast. Uh, and what people have found here in these small mountainous rivers is that it's really, and particularly as you move from kind of a more humid to more arid situation, is that essentially um, <coughs> most of the sediment is being transported by rare high magnitude events. So it's big floods are producing most of the sediment. When most of the big rivers that you get into, it, that starts to flip around. And this is sort of like the humdrum average flow ends up uh, discharging most of the sediment. But certainly here, and particularly as we get down to Southern California, it's really uh, oftentimes um, the kinds of flows that we're seeing, you know, maybe once every year, five years, or 10 years, that are producing most of the sediment from these rivers. They're really highly episodic and large flood driven in terms of their uh, effective discharge of sediment, their, their, the, the majority of discharge of sediment from the systems. Right? Um, so all of that suggests that yeah, these systems probably don't behave the same way all the time. Right? Of course, if you go into a different discharge uh, regime or di a different part of the discharge domain, well, maybe that is described by one curve, and it's just, you can use that curve to, to, to calculate your effective discharge. But since things are changing so much, and they're so episodic, and there's a lot of feedback in the systems, we might expect that you actually have more time-dependent behavior in the systems as well, right? You might expect that the relationship between concentration and discharge might change over time, right? And so that instead of stationary behavior, we may have non-stationary or or to, to be safer if there's any um, st statisticians in the room, we might call just simply time-dependent behavior in these systems um, at, over the kinds of scales that we monitor. Right? Um, and so some people have done quite a bit of work on this uh, on the west coast of the US and in California, um, including some people that, that have, that have uh, mentored me, like John Warwick, um, who found that in the Eel River, for example, uh, which experienced the great Christmas flood in 1964 it was something like maybe a 200 year event, but it's one of those kind of arc storm events that becomes sort of impossible to kind of characterize in those terms, right? Because it may be a 500 year event, we just don't have the kinds of records to characterize the flood frequency of a storm that size that well. Um, but what he found was, and here we have water year margin from 1950 to 2010, and you have suspended sediment concentration on the log scale, it's already been corrected essentially for relationship to discharge, right? um, And you see that discharge corrected concentration essentially decreasing over the last, you know, about a half century since that huge flood event, right? So essentially in this case you have um, an interdecadal scale system rebound from a massive event that drastically uh, augmented sediment supply that's been slowly essentially shifting down over the past uh, several decades. So that, that's a good interdecadal scale example of this um, temporal dependence and suspended sediment dynamics. Uh, and then moving on to the Salinas watershed where I did a lot of my PhD work, um, you know, a similar size watershed to the Eel, about 10,000 square kilometers, steep mountainous area, um, not as steep as the Eel, 
uh, with bedrock that's not nearly as erosive as the old bedrock, um, and also not subject to the same degree of precipitation. In this case, we had a pretty good suspended sediment record, um, uh, mostly collected by the USGS, but also by ourselves uh, over a time period when the system actually, well, I should point out, we have a lot, the, the western part of this uh, watershed is wetter than the interior. And the last of the sort of major kind of uh, wetter mountainous subbasins that isn't dammed is the Arroyo Seco. Okay. Now the Arroyo Seco <coughs> upper watershed pretty much completely burned the marble cone fire of 1977. And then it just so happened as we were monitoring it during the beginning of my PhD, it com almost completely burned again. Right, so we were left with one of those, and I don't think anybody got hurt, so I could be happy about it. We were, <laughs> we were left with one of those situations where we had like an essentially like a, a natural laboratory type scenario, not a paired basin, but actually the same basin, right? That had been burned almost completely twice, similar burn intensities in the chaparral. You know, the system had, come, had, had had a chance to come back to essentially peak mature chaparral conditions, um, <clears throat> and and some oak woodland, but. The difference between these two time periods was that after the 1977 fire, uh, the result was about a hundred times increase in sediment flux out of this little watershed, right? And after the 2008 basin complex fire, it only had about a, the, the, the response in terms of sediment was about 2x back then. Very anemic response, even though the whole thing had burned, right? It was ready to go. The difference was in the kind of water year that happened, the kind of wet season that happened. <coughs> so after the 77 fire, it was like a, a one in 10 year kind of winter. Right? After the, the, the basin complex fire, it was just, it was just an average winter. Right? And that led to a 50 times difference in, in the amount of sediment that, mm -hmm. that moved out of the system. Now some might argue that there, there may have been some previous exhaustion from the previous wildfire that has a possibility as well. Okay. Um, for much of the rest of my PhD, I focused on the whole watershed and went down a complete rabbit hole in terms of trying to look at finer scale temporal dynamics right? and looking at how antecedent conditioning of, of the entire watershed, just in terms of essentially the sequence of different kinds of um, precipitation runoff uh, events and, and years and droughts, might affect essentially the, the smaller scale temporal dependence patterns in that system. And we found some things that make sense in terms of these kinds of ephemeral systems, including loading and flushing regimes um, that, are, that are related to per persistent hydroclimatic cycles, such as El Nino, uh, and even some clues that, that, act, that changes in agricultural operations were actually decreasing the sediment supply of the system at this point, um, as a lot of the irrigated agriculture there was shifting towards drip irrigation over the past um, uh, hmm. 30 years, 20, 30 years. Hmm. But I'm not going to go into all those details because we don't have time, and you can you can read the papers if you're into that kind of thing. Okay. But since then, I, I've kind of moved on to, to looking at many of the watersheds on the West Coast, at least those that actually have enough suspended sediment data. And the reality is, we just don't have that much. Data. It's difficult to monitor, monitor suspended sediment, right? Because, in part because we have those those um, depth dependencies in terms of concentration. So. You, you know, you need people that are dedicated like the USGS to go out there and do it correctly, and oftentimes their funding gets cut over time, right? So if you look at all the little small mountainous watersheds on the, on the continental US uh, west coast, we only have about 23 that have 10 years of data or more. And none of that's continuous, mostly just, uh, you know, 50 samples to maybe 800 samples total. Okay, so it's mostly sporadic, low resolution, um, and oftentimes, with these kinds of data sets, you're missing those rare effective floods, right, that are producing a lot of the sediment. Um, because in part, you know, they, when they happen, they usually only last for a, a, a day or two or 10, and they're also really challenging to monitor because they're really dangerous. Right? And really, in the end, we have almost, we have very little sediment composition and associated contaminant data for any of these watersheds. But if we go through and, and fit rating curves, all these, in this case, this is a, a sort of semi-parametric method where we're not sort of shackled to any given empirical formula, we just use low S. Um, and then we take those fits and we subtract the fitted relationship 
from the observed to get our residuals, right? So we're essentially correcting for discharge. Then we can inquire, we can look into those residuals over time and, and see, uh, see if we actually have temporal patterns in these relationships. And one really simple way to do that when you have these, and forgive me, really crappy data sets, you know, that aren't, aren't high resolution and aren't regular, we can't use kind of more sophisticated techniques of this kind of time series analysis, but a really simple way is to just sequentially sum those residuals. Right? Just line them up over time and, and, and cumulatively sum them. And so that's what you see here for all of these different rivers. And what that can reveal to you are these sort of persistent periods of higher <coughs> sediment concentrations or lower sediment concentrations. Right? And in a system where you have like a, a monotonic trend, right, you would expect to see it one cycle. Right? A high period and then a low period. And we indeed we see that in a lot of systems in the north. Um, and then we see we see um, temporal patterns or, or persistent patterns that are sort of operating across a number of different temporal scales from essentially seasonal to um, interdicated. Um, and one of the things that really jumps out if you if you stack all of these rivers together and then just classify these different runs, and you have to do some uh, make some decisions in terms of what you're going to call a persistent period or not. But essentially what we find in general um, is that you have decreasing over the entire time period for these systems and you have a lot of red on the right and a lot of green on the left, right? So a lot of these systems appear to be decreasing in terms of their sediment loading. And if you look at these northern, southern Oregon to northern California rivers here, these little <coughs> blue triangles are indicating the largest flood event that happened during this entire period of record, mm -hmm. so from the 1950s to 2010. Mm -hmm. This is all the 1964 flood, and all of those systems are essentially behaving about the same, right? They all appear to be continuing, at least until the end of the records, and many of them fall rather short, but most of them appear to be continuing to respond, or at least responding over spans of, of decades, years to decades, to that massive event that augmented sediment supply and was then drawn down over time. Um, okay. And so what, what could cause these temporal patterns? And we talked about massive floods, and I did a little bit of arm waving about the stuff I did in my PhD that was a little more complicated, but <coughs> human patterns uh, or human impacts are very important, as we know, right? And we talked a little bit about uncommon before and urbanization. Now, if you think about all these systems that are decreasing in their sediment loading as they move forward, some, some are increasing, but most aren't. One thing that's also been noted at the global scale, and here again, here we're going from like 3,000 years ago, <coughs> ago to the present, and this is <coughs> ratio of pre-human sediment load to sediment load. What you see essentially, and this is work from Walling in 2006, and he, he's sort of one of the godheads of this among some others, is that as human agriculture comes on board, sediment supply, sediment loading increases in some cases very drastically, <coughs> and it corresponds to the timing of the agriculture. Then as you get into the 20th century, sediment loads are falling drastically, right? And the main reason is impoundment. Right, and many in mm. many areas are still kind of coming online in terms of mm. in terms of uh, putting in the, the kinds of dams that they're able to, uh, and then also afforestation and some, and some other kinds of stabilization. Okay, and we have certainly some of that happening here in California. Mm. Uh, there's probably some other really interesting things going on with the economy of timber harvesting and, and regulations up north as well. Uh, but the, the issues here in SoCal are very complex, and I, I didn't go into them, but. Uh, the amount of urbanization that's gone on, um, there, there's, some, there's some really interesting things to, to tease into. Okay. So what are the downstream implications of all this? Um, well, I'm just gonna highlight one study that, um, that we're kind of finally starting to wrap up um, that I've been working on with colleagues since I was a PhD student. Um, again, here's the Salinas River, there's the Arroyo Seco, Here's the Salinas uh, River Lagoon, Elkhorn Slough, which actually used to be connected to the mouth of the Salinas River not that long ago. Um, but in this case, we were also, we weren't just studying the sediment dynamics over the monitoring time period of the last 50 years. We we're also collecting cores from these coastal regions 
Um, to exploit those as records of past change and to better understand what was going on with this system uh, from a sediment dynamic standpoint over a longer period of time, right? And one thing that we found was, you know, over the instrumented time period, we could actually find discrete flood packages from uh, the largest uh, flooding events that had happened during that time period. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and that's sort of a bit of a trick. Right, because we happen to be coring in a place where everything lines up to allow that to happen. But oftentimes, it's not that simple. Oftentimes, um, things like sedimentation rate don't scale with with actually the size of the floods that you're seeing. But in this case, they did, and it it, it worked out to show us that you know the, the sediment the accretion was scaling with the size of floods, um, and it was it was uh, scaling to other sort of more effective representations of flood of uh, of the intensity of those flood magnitudes, rather than like simple representations of wetness, like annual precipitation, right? Which makes sense because that, you know, it's it's really uh, the the flood events that are controlling the sediment flux in this case, and that also kind of highlights a problem that often happens as you try to do these kinds of paleohydrology reconstructions is that we often use sediment deposits and say, well, this is a wet period and this is a dry period, right? Oftentimes, in some of those situations, what you're dealing with is, is a deposit from an effective event, not necessarily a wet period, right? Um, in some cases, that may just be something that burned and then had a pretty good water year after that. And so, what we found in the Salinas Delta, um, is, as we went further back in time, is that the kinds of patterns of accretion that we were seeing um, did tend to line up with some of the other uh, sort of late Holocene uh, climatic cycles, right? Probably because some of those cycles really impact the generation of some of these effective events, at least that's what we think, rather than uh, capturing general wetness or general dryness in this context, okay? But you, you should, Keep in mind that all of this is in the context of a delta that we've calculated to have something on the order of a 1% trapping efficiency for the sub-area delta. Right? Extremely tiny. And that's something that people often overlook with these steep mountain systems is that you know, the, the sub-aerial accretional uh, portion of the estuary is actually trapping a very, very tiny amount of sediment in, in many cases, much, much less than people think. Okay. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, you know, we, we see temporal dependence as a common characteristic of sediment dynamics, sediment, sediment dynamics, fine sediment dynamics at the watershed scale and, and across uh, a number of temporal scales. And we have to consider these supply dynamics and move beyond just thinking about these systems as kind of stationary, um, ex, you know, stationary sediment generation and transport devices, but rather, um, systems that respond dynamically to changes uh, in climate and human activities. Um, and that also translates to the sort of accretionary signal that we find in the coast as well. Um, and really, sediment watershed management approaches, and I, I, I started to sort of step towards management at the beginning of this talk, and then I <laughs> went right into the science, and this is me coming back to it. Uh, I've been involved in some sediment management stuff recently with multi-stakeholder groups. And boy, oh boy, is it complicated. And, and it, these kind of dynamics are sort of the anathema of easy management. It's hard enough when you get a bunch of people with competing interests in the room, but then when you start talking about the fact that the natural system is so variable, it really becomes difficult to set targets, right? Um, which has led to lots and lots of problems um, with doing it really kind of uh, process-oriented and quantitative set of management. That's a whole different. Thanks.